Aloha, everyone. I'm your host, Christina Laney Mitri, and welcome to Smart Living Hawaii's podcast, where we discuss smart homes and technology, sustainability, healthy lifestyles, and smart business. Today, we'll have a sustainable leader series talk with Hiro Nago. He is the president of EM Hawaii LLC, and uh, he leads the Genki Aluai project. We will learn about EM which are effective microorganisms and ways we can use them to heal our soils, fresh water sources like our Alawai Canal and more. EM in many countries is providing solutions to problems we face globally, such as food production, depletion of natural resources, environmental pollution, food safety, nutrition and health. So let's dive in and how EM works. Aloha, Hiro. Aloha, Christina. Aloha, Thank everyone. You much for joining us. I wanted to do this last year when we started our um, fundraising service project with you, but obviously um, we were so busy and slammed at this time we weren't able to do it. So we are launching our second annual for the Genki Alawai project and I wanted to share that with our listeners. It's um, something we never knew about. So before I begin, let me tell you a little bit about Hero. Hiro Nago, his um, ancestral roots come from Gushikawa, Okinawa in Japan. His father, grandfather immigrated at a young age and moved his family to various islands and finally sell, settled in Kula on the island of Maui, which by the way, I don't know if you heard, uh, Oprah just bought 870 acres of that land. <laughs> Did they sell yours? No. <laughs> um, his father was raised on a vegetable farm and Hiro grew up in an environment of naturally growing foods and having fond me memories of visiting the Maui farm. This led Hiro to change his major from engineering and earned a bachelor's degree in horticulture hurt from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So after graduation, Hiro wanted to learn more about his Okinawan roots so he lived and worked as an assistant English teacher for intermediate and elementary schools in a small rural town called Sashiki, Sashiki for five years. Um, inspired after attending several lectures in Okinawa and reading An Earth Saving Revolution by Professor Teruo Higa, Hiro decided that promoting the benefits of EM and getting away from the overuse of chemicals would be his life mission. So let's see, I will leave the rest up to you in um, a story of how, you know, we are where we're at today and how you have your EM Hawaii LLC. Um, so yeah, I kind of covered some of your background, but um, is there anything else you'd like to share about growing up with your family and, and the travels? Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for um, the introduction and collaboration with uh, Echo Rotary and yeah, we did a lot last year and we're doing a lot again this year as well, too. Uh, just to um, let you know that, you know, I'm not the leader, but the technical advisor for the Genki Alawai project. We we are small members, about six of us. Uh, there's Ian Peleo, Marianne Kobayashi, uh, my wife Chikako, and we also have Fumiko Sato-chan that's always doing our video and interviews and Recently, my son joined EM Hawaii as well, too. So you see him a lot uh, to coming out to all of our events. So again, thanks again for that introduction. Awesome. So going back to growing up, I always like to kind of hear the story, share the stories of how people found themselves in sustainability because there's definitely different sectors of sustainability and it's usually something that tugs on your heart um, to bring you into a space that usually does not provide funding until later <laughs> and if that <laughs> um, okay. so anyhow um, would you like to share a little bit more maybe on the inspiration of where you are today and how you got there yeah, so basically, as you mentioned, you know, I grew up in an environment of eating natural grown food. So I would follow my dad. They had a, a natural farm church promoting uh, these kind of methods and, of course, trying to get away from chemicals. It's kind of a challenge, of course. So when I went through um, University of Hawaii uh, in horticulture, you know, a lot of people 
we're still using conventional methods. And then when I went to Okinawa, Japan, and I heard Dr. Higa, you know, talk about his lectures about how conventional, he himself was actually a professor in horticulture, right? And then um, he didn't want to go backwards and he really believed in agrochemicals and he was using it in his research on growing citrus trees. And then in his early, uh, I guess the thirties, um, in the sixties anyway, so he, wasn't feeling good. So, um, you know, he went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, Professor, he got, you got pesticide poisoning. So he actually realized the toxicity firsthand that, you know, agrochemicals not was only harming the environment, but human health. So then he dedicated his research on studying microorganisms and it was about 15 year journey, right? So it's like finding a needle in the haystack, but he isolated about 2000 species that he uh, no, were uh, beneficial for mankind, and he kept saving them. And one day, you know, he usually standard practice sterilize and toss it, but he just felt it was so um, it was a waste. So anyway, he kept saving these beneficial microbes, and when he put on some grass, the grass just grew tremendously. So then he realized it was a mixed combination of these beneficial microbes uh, that was the key, and he kind of isolated to the basic three that we use today. But yeah, it was a Nice long journey. When I heard about his lecture and his journey as well, too, I thought, wow, that's just amazing, you know. Um, and, you know, that's why he mentioned how farmers themselves, you know, they're stuck um, and they can't profit, right? Because you're using so much chemicals and the bugs will get resistant and you got to come in with a stronger one and they'll get resistant. And, you know, you're just depleting the life in the soil. So uh, it's no wonder farmers can't make money. So this was a really tremendous um breakthrough I felt and you know a lot of third world countries around the world were really interested uh, in this technology so I was there at a great time when um, he formed EM research organization the body that was in charge of this information of the technology that he developed um, and yeah so I joined in as a researcher about a year later in 1995. Awesome and so from what brought you back to Hawaii so you were researching here or you were researching over there? Right. So um, as you mentioned, I was born in Okinawa. We moved back. So I got up here in the islands, um, you know, public school, Mai Mai Elementary, Kanako, oh, yeah? McKinley High School. Yeah. So um, public school and then right UH. So after that, I went to Okinawa. So I was living there five years. So I did my intern and Hawaii wasn't ready yet, actually. So uh, yeah. we moved back. And then, but I knew already I wanted to work for EM. And then after that, um, just about three months or half a month later, you know, we had my son, Corey. So we moved back. I was Mr. Mr. Dad taking care of my son until I got the call back that, okay, we're finally ready. Uh, we have a, um, a local uh, person that wanted to do a joint venture. So I went back to Okinawa to um, get that operation ready. So, uh, you know, did an intensive um, studying on how, all the different aspects of the technology, even production. So we could start Hawaii 1997. Yeah. Wow. So I guess it's been, I want to say like a hidden secret. I mean, a lot of people did not know about EM until I think, well, the microorganisms have started becoming more prevalent, I think, with just healthy soil, right? And so I think with our Eco Rotary Group, we had, um, I think April, was it April that reached out to you originally, right? Mm -hmm. To come and speak at our Eco Rotary Club um, a couple years ago and talk on Bokashi right. and composting. And um, so before we get into Genki, because it is very different, um, he did come and speak to us. We were, we were working on soils and composting and trash and garbage. And we were like, not working on this, but we were kind of, unfolding all of this and educating our members within our Eco Rotary group with all of these amazing speakers. So that's why Hiro met with us first. And then he started talking about the Genki balls and then all of a sudden we're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, so I'm not gonna get into the Genki yet, but let's um, let's explain, because if people are listening to this and they don't know what EM is, then mm -hmm. let's just explain that first, how it works, um, and then into more of like the Bokashi composting and how it helps, like for the, you know, the, the soil first. Yes. Let's go there. <laughs> yeah. So you're right. So again, even um, 
yeah, a lot of people didn't know that soil was alive and USDA actually came out with International Year of the Soil. So that's a time when um, we were actually invited to many events to talk about um, the microorganisms, right? So according to USDA, just one teaspoon of a healthy soil has up to 100 million to billion bacteria. So the soil is actually alive. And so, you know, the microbes in EM, EM stands for Effective Microorganisms. So um, that's our trademark name. And EM1 is microbial inoculin is our actual product name. Um, the microbes in EM is actually lactic acid bacteria. So that's used to ferment, right? So you make yogurt, cheese. Uh, the other one is yeast, which is used to make bread beer, and of course, wine that adults like to consume. And the other one is phototropic bacteria. So that's a rhodosudomonas species. So this is one of the most primitive microorganisms. If you can imagine, that's how Earth, uh, when it was just full of hydrogen sulfide, all these gas, you know, these guys came in probably from outer space. They started consuming all the um, hydrogen sulfide ammonia and then started producing oxygen through photosynthesis. And that's how life, you know, evolved to um to an area where all these um, different microbes and plants and uh, life started to um, change because it could survive in oxygen but the phototropic bacteria they don't like oxygen so now they poison themselves and you find them in ponds lakes um, and people are starting to research more of them for uh, bioremediation purposes but dr higa early on uh discovered that yeah these guys can actually um survive and do what they do uh, with combination of these other microorganisms. So it's pretty specific to EM1, yes. Awesome. So now that we have an understanding of what effective microorganisms are, um, could you explain how it works to heal the soil, right? Or to add to the soil to then produce the amazing vegetables that you guys right. I've seen in your pictures and stuff it's just like wow <laughs> and you know you're not everything is natural I mean that's that's the key too right like right. everything is natural and if anybody's seen um uh why does my brain always forget I think I mentioned this like almost every time um in the in the episodes that I'm doing but the Netflix show that came the movie that came out mm -hmm. um kiss the ground kiss the ground I don't yeah. know why I, I always <laughs> I always mess that up yeah. but kiss the ground kind of lays the foundation for for this mm -hmm. um and then it makes more sense too uh yeah. if you watch that movie <laughs> if I'm not because yeah. people are just listening in right we don't have yeah. all these diagrams to show yeah. everybody on a podcast so yeah. um I tell but people that's the quickest just watch way that, to watch that reverse movie. climate change yeah yeah. But, yeah. So yeah. microbes, if you can scale that up, you know, they're all around us. They're in the air, in the water. You know, they're all in our bodies as well, too, you know, in your gut flora. And that's why probiotics are such a big thing. But that's what EM is. It's a probiotic for your soil. Right. So, um, you know, in nature, you have beneficial ones. You have the pathogens that can cause disease. But most of them, about 70 percent are neutral. Right. So they're opportunistic. And they just follow the leader. So it depends on the environment. So like right now, we're getting all these heavy rains. It's humid, you know, um, just like in your bathroom, what happens, right? You got mold, mildew, right? It's the kind of condition that they want to grow and thrive. But when you spray EM on it, you can actually suppress the disease-causing ones. And the guys in the middle follow the leader. So now all these oh. other beneficial microbes or the opportunistic ones uh, follow the leader. And you can see um, all these beneficial results uh, and keeping the other pathogens in check, right? So we're not eliminating, we're not killing uh, all these microbes, right? Because they have a purpose. That's why they're around in nature, right? Uh, but we're just changing in a way that um, we can produce all these other beneficial effects while suppressing the disease at the same time. So it's pretty amazing um, how you can learn from nature. And then um, could you give a little bit of understanding on Bokashi composting, because I know that that's kind of part of what you feature within mm -hmm. your business. Right. So EM Hawaii LLC, um, maybe you could explain that business side because yeah. we'll dive into the Genki Aloai Project, sure. which is a nonprofit, yeah. and then what your for-profit does. Right. So we established um, a joint venture called EM Hawaii Incorporated. 
Uh, so that was a joint venture between a local business person and EM Research. So I was a researcher at that time, and we started um, like the Honolulu Zoo and all these other projects early on that incorporated EM for odor control, composting, and then um, actually we started more for odors as well too, because we started with Hilton Hawaiian Village with their penguin exhibits, uh, flamingos. So, you know, the smell is the easiest thing that you can see results, right? When you spray EM, they actually digest, like I said, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, um, and, you know, just create a natural environment for animals to survive. The hippopon, also we kept the algae in check so they didn't have to use as much chlorine. So again, the zookeepers, we created an environment so that the animals are healthy, healthy and they didn't have to use as much uh, chemicals, right? To, uh, contain the they so, use chemicals in the hippopotamus water? Well, oh. you know, because um, a lot of them defecate in the water, right? So um, you get slippery and you can get algae growth and stuff like that. So they'd have to come in and you have to kind of sanitize it, right? So that's what they would do to clean the area. Oh so, my gosh, uh, that doesn't seem, <laughs> guess it'd be like living in a pool. Kind of, sort of, right? So, but that's why we, um, they needed also help. living in your poop, so. <laughs> yeah, when we first started, they had so many hippos, right? So Cleo was the large, uh, oldest one in captivity. And then, so they would just rotate them in the, pot, in the pool. And when we first started, you couldn't even see the hippo. It was, they had these blue algaecides like for your toilet bowl and that wasn't really healthy for the hippos too and then we started EM in there and, and that naturally kept the um, algae in check but better yet was the settling pond which all the um their poop was like pretty much hay right so they feed on hay and it was hard to compost but with the microbes of EM in the water it would naturally break down and they didn't have to scoop up all that build up so usually before EM it would just pile up and they would either of a backhoe or the zookeepers would have to shovel all that out. And after introducing EM, um, they didn't have to do that. And, That's so yeah. cool. Yeah, it was, it was a great start. But yeah, getting back to like Bokashi and stuff like that, I think that got more famous because of recycling food waste, you know, very innovative. Usually you can't compost things like meat, fish, high protein, cooked food, uncooked food. Uh, but because of the fermentation process, you're pickling all that, you're pre-treating it with our EM microbes um, in a few weeks, you can just transfer that in the soil and the soil microbes will break it down um, in another two to four weeks. So it's really quick. So a lot of people um, we introduced it in the Department of Education with my uh, teacher partner, Marianne Kobayashi for service learning. And that was when we had the landfill issue, right? So we had that going to the schools and teaching the teachers uh, coming up with a curriculum. And then after that, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Kukua Hawaii Foundation Aina in schools, Jack Johnson. Uh, they started coming in and started um, adapting that for their third grade composting lesson plans. So awesome. besides worm, vermicasting, they had uh, Bokashi as well too. So that was great to introduce it early on to a lot of the schools in the um, Aina in School Hawaii program. Yeah. Cool. So from healthy soils to clearing out hippo <laughs> pools, <laughs> we're going to move into Genki balls. So when we worked with Hero, our Eco Rotary Club of Kaka'ako worked with Hero last year, Jenny and I went to go help with the keiki at, uh, I think it was Jefferson. Was it Jefferson? That oh, was uh, Alawai. To see what they were doing. And um, when they mentioned these little dirt balls that look like someone making a spaghetti meatball, basically, mm -hmm. um, it was something that's really fun that kids would do and they wanna always play in the mud and get dirty anyway. So it's like one of those things where, you know, it's very family friendly. And um, when we went there and we were seeing this entire school, like you know, all of the elementary, every single grade, and they were all doing it and they all had their 15 minutes and they all came every class. And at the end, I was like, wait, we only did a thousand? <laughs> you know, I was like in my head. And then they're small, right? We were just like, oh, we could do this. Let's do this. You know, I'm like, let's do like 5,000. And you're like, what? <laughs> and like, we had that idea in our head and we're like, okay, well, maybe we'll just do 600. Well, we could definitely do 600. Like, we have to raise money. And then we're just like, oh, and then how are you going to convince people to 
come and play with dirt and make <laughs> so you know it's evolved into this uh fundraising project that's a service project which i find very i i've been with a lot of nonprofits over the past 15 20 years and on different boards and fundraising is always part of part of that nonprofit and how you're going to raise money for the cause is always up for question and so we were starting off as a very young rotary club focused on the environment and but we have a lot of contacts and we have some driven people ready to um put some people together to raise some money so instead of doing maybe a more typical ticket based fundraiser that you would normally do with rotary um we were in the middle of a pandemic so we couldn't do something like that and we had to do outdoor stuff and um we just thought well maybe we can raise funds by selling these balls right and i think before us that we didn't really you guys didn't do that huh you just raise funds to get the balls done for yeah so yeah usually we would ask donations from other businesses as well too right so we're the Genki Ali project is a student teacher focus as part of their play-based STEM education. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of planning. Um, again, making Genki balls is like a two-step process, right? Mm -hmm. So even with the kids, we have them sift the soil, take out all the rubble, all the rocks, the compost, all the twigs, because you can't really form nice uh, Genki balls. It looks like andagi or like you said, meatball right and um, it's funny a lot of the kids they never formed or play with soil too so they had a hard time making balls in the beginning so some of the younger ones would have to form it for them and they would finish it up but it, they all had fun you know getting their hands dirty um, but yeah it's a two-step process once you do that you make the balls you let it sit and cure for at least two weeks right so the microbes are uh, growing in the soil itself and it comes nice white fuzzy which is the yeast and then um, after that we let it dry and it's ready for use, but, you know, you can store it for a couple of months. Um, the sooner or better you toss it, I think it's better because they're more active. Um, but yeah, a lot of preparation, storage, you know, there's a lot of cost behind all of that, right? So uh, we came up with, you know, like a donation amount. And then I think you guys took, took that on, you know, um, with our guidance and then uh, took that to the next level. Um using it as a fundraiser. And, you know, of course we benefited from that as well too. So we um, appreciate that collaboration. Yeah, so um, we're doing our second annual Genki Ball Drop um, and we're starting this weekend, which is on Saturday for the making of the balls for us to make 5,000 balls. And um, we have sponsors that have committed to a certain amount and then they bring their employees as a as a work day to come and do this along with anybody else who wants to donate five dollars per ball they can come and help make balls as well and then on the first which is um which i really liked is the kickoff of earth month um april 1st not april fool's day i mean it is april fool's day but we're looking at it as the first day of earth month and um what better than to you know donate money and clean the olawai and drop your balls so we'll be doing that on the first and if anybody happens to be interested you guys can definitely reach out to us um and the genki olawai project and hero and his team they are and you know integral part of this entire process and um we went from probably people that do about a thousand right to like five thousand last mm -hmm. year so it was a pretty laborious <laughs> big thing to do but i think um we're kind of refining everything and trying to make sure that we can do it just more smoother every year you know oh, so definitely. we keep this going mm -hmm. and um Maybe now's a good time to explain what's in your Genki ball because I think it's not a secret. No. <laughs> what's in your solution is more of a secret, but I mean, um, maybe you could tell them what's in it and why it make what you need, why you need what you put in there to make that. Right. Ball. Sure. But just before I get into that, just want to announce that um, the toss site, which is going to be in front of the Alawai Community Park, right? So it's it's an area that you know it's not regularly tossed because we usually do the stagnant end of the couple who end right because mm -hmm. that's the worst area so 
it's great that um, you guys chose to do it at that location again, because that area needs uh, more Genki Bar infusion, because that's where the Makiki Palolo streams meet, right? So coming down by Iolani School. So that's another good area. And luckily, um, you know, we've had more requests from other organizations. So we were limited to those two test sites because that's where we take the before and after tests. But now, you know, we have um, another partner with the Ritz Carlton residents. So now they're actually making and tossing right across the other side of the um, Alawai Canal, which is their kuleana, their responsibility. So they're also oh, wow. taking How before and after tests doing? too. So they're doing, uh, they commute to about uh, a thousand a month. So oh, they wow, have their own, awesome. yeah, the ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Ritz Carlton residents. Uh, you know, are committed to doing that. So they have the Genki Aloe project as part of their Malama Hawaii program. So actually guests can uh, book their stay through that program. They would donate, I think it was $5 and the hotel would match another $5. So if you want to do a staycation, uh, please go ahead, book that under the Malama Hawaii program. You get $10 credit, right? So their spa or for the restaurant. And then they would donate proceeds to the Genki Aloe project, um, you know, after so many uh, funds are built up but now they're also committed to doing the before and after water quality tests so now they're also using those funds for water quality tests plus also making the Genki balls uh, with the residents and there's uh, the staff right the ladies and gentlemen of the well, and it's almost I mean they're they're not just residents right there's people that are visiting from mm -hmm. wherever they're visiting so oh, yeah. it's kind of a good opportunity more of like the ecotourism side of things mm -hmm. to where you know people that are coming and visiting, we can get them more involved culturally and environmentally, which is yeah. the key to saving our Hawaiian, having it not depleted. Yes. So, um, and I know it's on the mission for um, the um, the tourist, um, Hawaii Tourist Authority and everything too. Right. And like the goals of the state to exactly. really try to move in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. For um, our tourism, options and things that people can do for fun oh definitely yeah. so i think yeah. that's so awesome yeah and then so this saturday besides the echo rotary we have the J uh, jtb japan travel bureau so they have the home festival coming up so again they with covid they didn't have that for past three years so this is the first one and of course our japanese visitors are not coming to the islands as much so they're focusing on students so they reached out to different schools so they could come out and visit all the um, different um, I want to say Venice exhibits, right, in the convention center. And then we have actually Genki Ball as featured as one of the um, exhibits at the Honolulu Festival with the foundation. So we're going to have half our team members at the convention center and they're going to oh, have an opening gonna ceremony. Split. So, yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> we're going to have an opening ceremony and then we um, they agreed to also um, take on the cost for the before and after. So we just were there at the Alawai Canal taking water quality tests so that we could start uh, our first toss in the convention center. So just to um, backtrack a little bit, that's where we actually started the Genki Alwai project when the Hokulea uh, was towed in after their Malama Hawaii um, uh, tour and they had the Malama Hawaii sale. So they went to different islands to thank everyone for their support. It was actually docked in front of the convention center in the promenade by the steps. So that's when we had uh, Governor Ige and I know Thompson and the three students that made the proposal of using Genki balls to clean up the Alawai Canal and make the Alawai Awesome Challenge actually toss the Genki ball. So that's kind of full circle that that's where we first And how long that. ago was that? What year? That was in uh, 2019. So actually 2000, uh, March, we started our um, affiliation with the Ex Hawaii Exemplary State Foundation, the nonprofit we're under. So April, we had that toss. Um, that was a great event. Um, you know, just having Nainua Thompson, right? Just having that message to the students. You know, I said, you know, if you guys can stay, can take care of this, I'll like, kind of make it clean. You can uh, tell anyone, you can do anything, right? So that was a strong message to the students, right? Their future leaders. And everybody gave up pretty much on the canal, right? Everybody, uh, they just know it's polluted. There's no solution. But here we do have a solution and the kids are actually involved with it, right? So they're doing it first and they're making themselves and they can see the results fairly quickly. And we can change that, you know, uh, within our lifetime for sure. <laughs> yeah. So could you let 
everybody know what's in the Genki balls and yeah. how it works and the sludge and everything and sure. what is bad in the aloe that gives yeah. us staph infection and why we yeah. just grew up knowing don't go and don't, don't yeah. touch the water. <laughs> Well, yeah, so it's called bioremediation and the ingredients are very simple. We talked about soil, right? So we use clay soil and then we have EM1, which is the lactic acid bacteria, yeast, and the phototropic bacteria. And microbes need food, so we also use molasses. So that's the sugar that the microbes feed on. And the also uh, ingredient is rice bran. So we get fresh um, milled rice uh, from sun noodles. So another great partner uh, in the Genki Alloy project. So those are the main ingredients that we have uh, in forming the Genki balls. And then um, when you put it into the Alloy, what does it do? You know, right. These don't so, float, they sink to the bottom. Yeah, so again, you know, we have all the runoff, right? So we have the three major streams, we have Makiki, Manoa, and Palolo streams. So for all from the urban core, and as we know, we had all these heavy rains, They'll overflow into the river. So all the um, detritus, you know, fecal bacteria, whatever it can be from cesspool, uh, just goes down the river and it's going to end up into the canal. So previously, before making the canal, you know, they would have a chance to go through low-E, taro ponds, fish ponds, and kind of filter out, right, before going to the ocean. And to develop uh, Waikiki to what we have today, they dredged and made the canal um, it took them about seven years, but so I, I, basically it's a catchment of all the runoff that we have, and that's why the sludge would build up. And because it's it doesn't have oxygen, it's in an anoxic state. You know, we have all the um, sludge buildup because they, the microbes in there can't digest and clean it up. As you know, in a healthy ecosystem, you'd have that uh, nice equilibrium. So they would have to usually dredge, you know, usually 10 years. Um, the most recent one before we started, they haven't dredged it for like 14 years. So, you know, some of the canoe paddlers, right, you had to paddle only on the far end towards the road because you had so much sludge buildup. I mean, there were a few inches, some of them, you could see uh, trees and branches sticking out and it was pretty bad. So uh, we started um, our Genki balls and then about a year later, they came in and dredged it. So then that kind of threw off the balance in the kapahula in the canal. Because once we tossed it, I mean, we could see the bottom is very clear. And then when they reached towards that back end, and then it started to, uh, again, just revert back. And it was kind of cloudy and it wasn't as clear as it was. So it's great that uh, we we're able to reverse it back. So if you go back there now, it's so clear and clean. Even with the heavy rains, you don't see the brown water. So it's pretty amazing uh, how the microbes are... Um, working you know 24 7 yeah and so how long would you say a ball lasts or like you if know, you drop it like that's you such know, a doing good question you know we've been tossing it so much in those two sites that uh, once you do toss it the fishes come already so it start feeding on the microbes or you know all the food so the fishes the animals they know what's good for them so when you drop the Genki ball, right? It goes down to the bottom, absorbs the water, it releases the microbes in the Genki balls. So other creatures that feed on microbes, like zooplankton, phytoplankton, fishes, they all come towards it. And it's gone in a day. So it's pretty amazing. When we tossed at the Ritz-Carlton, that was the first time. Um, I saw maybe uh, maybe 1%. There's like maybe 20 balls that weren't digested yet. So, you know, it was taking a little bit longer, but... I think more as more fishes come and they're used to seeing the sand now because when we first tossed, now we could see sand. There was Vecca coming in, right? And then uh, we didn't have uh, ama ama or baby mullets. So we had these big anai, which was like over 12 inches come in and they spawned. And now we see schools of mullets just thriving all around the area. We see uh, flashes of a hole hole with the silver silver turning around in that schools. And now, we, of course, we have kaku, which is a barracuda in there. Um, you know, the principal at Jefferson Elementary, he walks the canal and he sees uh, Moy. And I also saw uh, some Omilu back there. So one of our friends, they're good fishermen and the wife teaches at um, Alawai Elementary School. They caught Topio, but the next one that they caught, it was like almost 12 inches. So that's amazing mm -hmm. to see these big uh, Papio come all the way into the canal now. So um, I also heard there was a baby hammerhead recently. Yeah, TikTok. And then was, a was there a was there a manatee? 
huge manta ray. Yeah, that yeah. came up all the way up to Macaulay Bridge, right? So they're That's plankton crazy. eaters. So, you know, you can see, you know, those creatures come in means, you know, the health of the canal is really thriving now. And the other week, uh, and my son posted it, we were in the um, front of the convention center and we had a, um, a work walker there and they said, you know, my wife had pictures of monk seals. So we actually had a monk seal actually no come in. Yeah, it was a huge one. So um, if you look at our Instagram, you can share that. Oh, uh, she cool. shared that video and she took a video this time. It wasn't a photo because they're so quick. But yeah, it's amazing to see that um, happen just before all these events are coming up. Yeah, so and then exciting. some of the, uh, not research, but some of the um, testing and stuff that you do, maybe you could share some of the sure. latest testings and then also um, just so people know too, like, you know, there's all these fish coming in. It's like, you just like in Pearl Harbor, which is what I see in my view right now, you can't just be going fishing for this, these, you know, fish right. to eat because it's not healthy right. for us, you know, right. when you look and test the fish. So maybe you could share on that too. Cause yeah. I think, are you guys testing fish too lately? Um, ultimately that is our goal because yeah. um, we follow the department of health um, standards, the clean water branch. So before we started, we had meetings with the department of health clean water branch and um, we also had the San Francisco EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, um, uh, senior water quality officer there on loan. So she was actually at our meeting and she pretty much gave the guidance and direction for our permit. So uh, we're very, we're probably the first in the United States to do this in open water. So that was um, a great uh, thing to start here in Hawaii as a model for the rest of the world. So we follow their uh, criteria. So we look at, water quality, we had um, dissolved oxygen, temperature. Uh, we look at the fecal bacteria, enterococcus, uh, clostridium. We also check the salinity because we have a lot of fresh water coming in. So we can tell when we have a lot of water, right? So that's when we'll probably see higher incidence of the enterococci or the fecal bacteria. And of course, you know, we check the turbidity, how clear the water is. And of course, like ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and all those other water quality per parameters that we always check for before and after. And these are all just snapshots, right? Because we don't check it all like every month or something, but at least it's we do it uh, within the school year. So we do take it like in November and a couple of months in um, probably February. So we're looking for the next data set coming up pretty soon. Uh, so, but we did show, and you can see that on our website that uh, we did see the fecal bacteria going down. Uh, recently, we had all this heavy rain. Uh, it did go back up again, but after Genki ball toss, we saw the numbers drop into half. So yeah. um, before that was like, highest was like 1,300 and we got it below 50 and like 130 is the acceptable level. So it's pretty amazing to see that results. Um, the turbidity also was high about seven and now it's like a little over two, close to three. So again, you can see the bottom, it's really clear, right? Like so, the depth of the sludge too, right? Is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, and yeah. sludge levels, we also have been measuring it as well too. And from like 24, 23 inches, that's about knee deep down to about five, three inches now. That's where we tossed the ball. But earlier this year, January 10th, I saw these coral heads sticking out and that's further downstream. And in 10 days, that more of that coral head got exposed. So that's like 14 inches of this coral head just sticking out that's that cool. was buried before. We never seen it, right? So again, um, it's it's just amazing how the the microbes are really doing what they're supposed to do is digest on our waste. Yeah, that's yeah. For I'm just gonna do a little plug here, especially for Vi and all the work that they do on cesspools, um, because you mentioned. So basically, if people don't really know this, um, there's like about 90,000 cesspools still out in the state of Hawaii. And I think like 11 or thousand or, or so or 12,000 are here still on Oahu. And um, with cesspools for people that don't know, it's li literally 53 million gallons of raw sewage goes into our waters or into our ground you know water um down there every day 53 million gallons so when we do have these heavy rains it just kind of floods up 
you know, the cesspools. And guess what? Everybody's human waste is literally going down in and ending up in the olivai, which then ends up into the ocean. Um, so that's why it's not safe. <laughs> One of the reasons why it's not safe. So um, there's definitely things we're trying to help with um, mm -hmm. converting cesspools into yeah. other alternatives because yeah. it's a big part of something that like, even though we drop these balls, it's like, well, we're going to have to continue to keep doing it. It's like someone who picks up trash, you know, they're nice enough to pick up trash, but it's like, you're going to have to keep picking up trash until people stop littering. Right? Right. <laughs> so we have to like solve some of these, you guys yeah. are solving like immediate problems, but it's something that we're going to have to keep doing until we stop but, getting uh, all of these point that you brought into yeah. the water. Right. So, so that's a good Good point yeah. that you brought up. And, you know, there's a one water tax force, right? So working with the state department of health and, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, they said we don't have the money, right. To help the people to convert. So what do you do in the meantime? Right. So you mentioned 53 million gallons is going every day. So I think we just need to flip the switch and mandate treatment. Right. So again, we know that EN can keep the fecal bacteria down. They can break down the nutrients. So until they find the, the money to help people upgrade it, uh, I think we need to address that and then start with the treatment. And we do have um, septic cesspool service providers using EM already. So um, that's easy to do it here in the state of um, Oahu. And I think Big Island has the largest number of cesspools. Yes, and we do they have do. EM in all islands. So I think that's something that um, if the state wants to create a green task force, uh, we can easily do that uh, and educate yeah. them. And then the other thing is that I was curious, it costs a lot of money for the state or the city to dredge um, out the Alawai. I mean, I don't even know how much was it when they did it. The last one Alawai. was about 14 million. So $14 million in my mind is like, well, it could go to other things, right? If we find a way to remedy with what you are doing, <laughs> we I think have we to still need to it, dredge. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think we can do it now that they did dredge it. It'd be a lot less and be more of a maintenance. But you mm -hmm. know, we talked about microbes. They can digest um, organic, but it's not going to digest inorganic. So they found a lot of golf balls. You know, we talked about huge trees. You know, yeah. Kanu Palace pull out TVs and trash carts and all kind of stuff. Right. So the microbes are not going to digest that. So. We probably do need to dredge it every once in a while, but probably not as much now since yeah. we have the um, the microbes going in, you know, and they're oxygenating, right? So it devolves oxygen or even uh, over 100% because it's not only the atmospheric oxygen that we're actually measuring, but the microbes are also producing pure oxygen. And so that's one of the things is, you know, if you can oxygenate the bottom of the canal naturally, then you create a healthier ecosystem, right? And then mm -hmm. you don't have yeah. as much sludge as we see in the areas that we do toss. So I hope everybody learned a lot through this podcast. Um, a couple of shout outs too, is that I heard through um, in, I guess towards the end of last year, uh, you guys made it over to the big island with the Hilo Rotary Clubs. Yes. So again, uh, thanks to the connection through the Rotary. Um, April, right, she moved to Big Island and she was talking about all the work that was done here on Oahu with the Echo Rotary Kaka'ako. And of course, they got all excited. And uh, we have Susie Osborne and Connie Chan there uh, with the uh, Echo Rotary Hilo Sunset and I think Hilo so they were very, um, and they're passionate and they're very organized. So that's something, um, again, we have, I have my, I have a EM person there, Tim Lloyd, that's with me pretty long already, um, but thanks to their organization and connection, uh, we we're invited to present to the county. So after giving a presentation to the county, they were really excited and then also gave some funding actually to start the small pilot project of using Genki balls to help um, the Waihonu Pond, which is in the Lili Okalani Pond. So again, working together with friends of Lili Okalani uh, Park, uh, helping to take care of that Waihonu Pond. So it's kind of different. It's very different from the Alawai Canal. There's no real connection. There's two makahas actually water falls through, but after the big tsunami that came in and it pulled back a lot of the sediment, you know, they mm -hmm. weren't able to 
address all of that. So a lot of sediment, um, inorganic matter, uh, they have some invasive ogre coming in. So just helping to introduce the beneficial microbes in the Genki balls and again, um, helping to oxygenate it and just create a better condition. I think um, it's kind of exciting, especially for the city parks department that you know, we weren't able to address a lot of the issues after the tsunami. So um, I'm glad that we're able to help Big Island as well too. Yeah. That's so cool. And then the last thing that I just found out was we went to we went to a fish pond out um in Kaneohe side with Herb Lee and his um his fish pond. And this I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and we were doing a full um uh, fish catchment kind of, and they're testing the fish there because they've been working on that fish pond for like the past 30 years. And I was talking to Kua um, on the big island because one of my girlfriends, um, shout out to Ginger, she lives there and is working with that um, organization that helps fish ponds. And she said they went and were meeting up with different high schools. And I think it was Waianae High School, if I recall. And um, they were talking about using Genki balls. Did they are they working with you? Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's right. And then they have a great um, aquaculture system. They have their own um, deep well that has uh, seawater. And they're raising ogo on the side. And they had their own students actually test the Genki balls. I was invited to go back and see the initial progress. And yeah, the places that they tossed uh, further downstream, you, you can see sand now. You don't see the sludge. And then the areas, um, yeah, further downstream, the ogo is thriving now. So again, just the initial toss uh, got them very excited. They're designing another test. And then um, usually summer is when the temperature gets hot and then the ogo doesn't thrive so much. So it'd be interesting to see um, how the ogo thrives. And I did work with um, uh, Wally Ito. He's, um, again, another ogo Kumu and we used EM uh, dripping into a fish pond and then we saw that it could survive a lot better, you know, under stress conditions. So we do have some background uh, working with Limu and how that works. So I'm, I'm glad that the students are seeing the results firsthand, you know, at school. So it's great uh, laboratory. That's so cool. Stuff. Yeah. And that, like you said, it's not necessarily maybe you know, fecal matter or pollution, sometimes it is sediment and that's coming down. And sometimes it's like just things that are growing, right? Right on the water, like mangrove and the things that are a little too invasive for a fish pond that's there to, you know, grow fish that are probably more saltwater based and, and things like that. So it's really neat how this is just a natural option that people can start playing with and seeing how it works within a lot of different ecosystems, I guess, in this sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so it is a regulated project. So, you know, we do ask them to, you know, uh, work together with us so that we can have the baseline data. You know, we had a lot of requests. So we just give them the protocol. You know, we try to follow Department of Health and what we are given. And then, you know, make sure we have a before and after test. You know, it's not something just to make and toss because it's yeah. fun, right? You know, so we are data driven. Uh, and we want to show that, you know, why do we need Genki balls in the first place? Is it polluted? You know, can you show us the data? And based on that, then we can um, look at what we can do. You know, is it the right method? You know, can we have, yeah. you know, the, the best results with it? Or is it something else? So there was someone who came after last year and asked about Enchanted Lakes. Um, especially in the areas where it doesn't have an outlet at all. And it's one of the fingers, mm -hmm. probably Hawaii Kai too, but I know they specifically asked for this area because everything just kind of pulled right there. Would that be something they would reach out to you on? Or? Yeah, I think um, we have uh, residents, we have the Elks Club members. So again, just working with their board, right? For approval, get everybody's buy-in. So, you know, it's, one of the things of EM or the Genki Alawai project is collaboration, right? So you have to get the buy-in from all parties, you know, in order to proceed. And luckily, um, it is a complex, Alawai Kana is so complex that we had yeah. to reach out to different stakeholders. And luckily, we did have a lot of letters of support early on. And, you know, we we're able to see the results really quickly. And, you know, this is our fourth year now. We finished three years last year. So our goal is 
eight thousand a month to reach three hundred thousand within twenty twenty six. So that's our goal, right? But we do need funding. And oh, that funding. means we needed to have how much more? Wait, we have we have the rich doing a thousand a month, right? Yeah, we still have other organizations <laughs> tossing too, but that's our goal moving forward. But like you mentioned, we do want to test the tish, fish tissue sample. Uh, Department of Health had a consent decree that had high levels of lead and dildrin, which is a pesticide, right? So mm -hmm. once we can show um, these fishes that are munching on Genki balls now, you know, as they mature and get detox, um, if there's insignificant levels of lead and dildrin pesticide, that means safe enough to eat the fish, and then that's safe enough to swim, right? So again, we're also checking the fecal bacteria. You don't want to jump in during brown water, but you know, during the um, non-brown water days, you know, where we do have fecal count below 100, like 50, you know, then, you know, it's, it's safer than some of the beaches right now. Yeah, well, especially with the runoff that's going into the beaches, right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess this kind of wraps up our time. Um, I always like to share what the best way is to reach you and some of your social media uh, platforms. So they are if you're looking, there's two different places that you can really look. You can, if you're looking directly for like EM solution and, you know, reaching out to them either maybe for your soils or farming or, you know, reaching out on the business side, you can definitely check out EM Hawaii. Is it dot, dot com? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. EM Hawaii. Yeah. And then on there, you can look up EM Hawaii LLC on the Instagram and Facebook, and you can kind of reach out there. Um, but email wise, the best for them is info at EM Hawaii.com. Yes. And then if you are looking at uh, Genki Balls, or maybe you or your company is interested in doing something and partnering with them or donating, you can definitely donate to our fundraiser that we have annually, which is coming up if you want to do something right away because it just spurs your interest um and it would be five dollars a ball donation to come and uh throw the ball that you you purchase into the water on april 1st or maybe you want to do a drop with them in the future you can definitely reach out to would it be the same email address for you it'd be a uh, genki aloy at gmail.com Okay, so that one would be separate. And then they have their own website as well with like a lot of the data and mm -hmm. explaining everything that we had mentioned with a lot of pictures, which you don't get on a podcast. So it's a great site to go check out. And that is, I believe, GenkiAlawai.org. So right. thank you so much, Hiro and your team for working so hard. I know that everything has been ramping up. Um and I know we'll have a lot of newscasts out there, I believe, on, um, I think, is Saturday. it this week? This week's this yeah, Saturday this as well, Saturday. which is the 11th, um, to just get it out there so everybody knows exactly what it is you do and how awesome and rewarding it is, too, and family-friendly. So thank you again, and okay. we'll see you on Saturday. Thank you, Christina. Aloha. Okay, bye.